In recent days and weeks, there has been a military coup in the Sudan, violent uprisings in Ethiopia and Nigeria, an ongoing unrest in Afghanistan and Lebanon, just for starters. As I wrote this sermon, the number of people in the U.S. Had who had died from COVID-19 since last All Saints Day was 534,082. The number of people who died from COVID around the world since last All Saints Day is 3,757,399. Many people here and around the country are dis concerned and disturbed about last week's election results. So through all of this, though we are in the midst of life, we are in death. But in a world that fears and cheapens and desecrates death, the church remembers, honors, and grieves those who have died. Those in a world that uh, mistreats and abuses countless people, the church affirms the value of every single life. In a world that privileges the individual, the church honors the deep interconnectedness of all of God's family across time, across culture, across history, calling us to be attentive to the great cloud of witnesses that are surrounding us. Yes. In the midst of life, we are in death. But we have called this day All Saints Day to remind us of a deeper truth. In the midst of death, we are promised life. So it seems right then that today's appointed readings for All Saints Day are doused in tears. Tears of hope, tears of grief intermingled. In the gospel reading, Jesus cries at the grave of his friend Lazarus. In the reading from the prophet Isaiah, God promises to wipe away all tears from our eyes. And in the reading from Revelation, we hear the promise that one day there will be no more weeping. As one who is quick to cry myself, I find it validating to see the scriptures awash in tears. It means that God takes seriously the deep emotions that we feel, like grief and despair and joy. In the passage from Isaiah, God promises people who are living in exile, who are lonely and hopeless, that there will be a day when there is enough to eat and heartbreak will be a thing of the past, for God will swallow up death forever. Likewise, the vision of eternal life that the writer of Revelation paints for us, for his persecuted community, is one in which there is no more sorrow or pain. These beautiful images are not meant to instill in us a fake happiness or to promote Christian triumphalism. The promise of joy around the corner does not wipe out suffering now. God legitimizes mourning in these texts. There is room for the full range of psychological expression in the kingdom of God. When Jesus weeps in today's gospel, he demonstrates that it is okay not to be okay. Yes, Lazarus is about to be restored to life, but the promise of an impending celebration does not cancel out the essential work of grief. Both Mary and Martha express anger at Jesus for delaying his visit. And they both blame him for their brother's death initially. But Martha quickly adds that she trusts in Jesus' power and is the first in John's gospel to call Jesus the Messiah. And Mary kneels even as she complains, showing her humility in the presence of Jesus. Theologian Debbie, Debbie Thomas points out that when Jesus laments with Mary and Martha, he assures them that their brother is worth crying for, and also that they are worth crying with. Debbie Thomas writes, through his tears, Jesus calls us all into the holy vocation of empathy. 
And she goes on to point out that in John's Gospel, the raising of Lazarus is the precipitating event that leads to Jesus' own arrest and crucifixion. When word spreads about the miracle that Jesus has done in Bethany, the authorities decide that enough is enough. Jesus must be stopped. Jesus essentially trades his life for the life of his friend. So maybe Jesus' tears in Bethany also express some of his grief over his own impending death. His time with his friends is almost over. Jesus crying establishes powerfully that it is okay to yearn for life. It is okay to feel a sense of wrongness and injustice in the face of death. It is okay to mourn the loss of our vitality, of intimacy, of longevity. It is okay to love and cherish the gift of this life here and now, as well as to grieve for what is missing. When Jesus calls Lazarus out of his grave, he doesn't then abandon Lazarus to cope with his complicated new life and the hazards of this new life all over again. He doesn't say to Lazarus, go on your way, live a deeply significant life. No. When Lazarus emerges from the dark tomb back into the challenging, tear-stained, exasperating world that we live in, with the added layer of being an oddity in his community for the rest of his second life, Jesus enlists the support of others. Jesus turns to all the saints who are standing around and commands them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus participated in the grief and sadness with weeping. And now Jesus invites us to participate in God's life-giving work. Resurrection is not something that happens only in the sweet by and by that we should anticipate. It is also and equally a matter of right now. There is something to do, even while our cheeks are still wet from tears. What is it that breaks your heart? What is it that splits you open with sorrow? What enrages you? by these things, could your tears be a calling from God to engage in unbinding and letting go some part of God's creation? Because I am convinced that whatever moves us to tears, those are messages from God. Those things that overwhelm you with outrage and joy, those are prayers. And I believe that we can find the courage to take action based on those prayers, even in the midst of fear and sadness, because we belong to a communion of saints, both living and dead. In the community of God's people, we worship and we work and we pool our money and our energy with other people's resources, because being a saint is daunting. Doing it alone would be excruciatingly painful. Surrounded by massacres of innocence and the politics of fear and division and the rhetoric of hate, we need each other to remind us that the life-choking forces of evil do not get to have the last word. So today, even as we mourn those that we have loved and lost, even as we weep over the misuse of this fragile planet, even as we lament oppression and violence, we also acknowledge that we are the recipients of God's resurrection life, of God's grace, of God's power, now and forever. We open ourselves up to being instruments of life and grace and power for the sake of the world. And this whole process, to me, is best understood in this poetic verse, which is my favorite from the trademark hymn for All Saints Day. And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long, steals on the ear this distant triumph song. And hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. 
Alleluia, Alleluia.